This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Gehring. Back to back, triple digit losses led by healthcare stocks after the Treasury announced new rules to halt so called inversion deals, leaving some large proposed acquisitions hanging in the balance. Big bank theory. Volatility is back just in time to close out the quarter, and that could be good news if you hold shares of the big money center banks. Where business meets politics, President Obama, former President Clinton, and the wealthiest man in China, Alibaba's Jack Ma, gather today to discuss some of the biggest issues facing business. We have all that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Tuesday, September 23rd. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Tyler Matheson. Stocks sold off sharply again today. The Dow had its worst day since early August and its first back-to-back triple-digit losses since June. The S&P 500 and the Nasdaq each finished at five-week lows. More market details in just a moment. Well, one reason for the sell-off was a sharp slide in health care shares. Why? Well, because last night, the Treasury announced new rules that make so-called tax inversions harder. Those are the deals some companies have used to skirt U.S. taxes by buying a foreign company and then moving the newly combined firm's headquarters offshore. Drug, biotech, and medical device companies have been the most ardent users of inversions. Some with pending deals were among the hardest hit today on the stock market. Medtronic down 3%. It aims to buy the drug maker Covidian for $43 billion and rebase to Ireland. A 2% drop for AbbVie. It's looking to buy the drug maker Shire for $55 billion and move to the UK. Shire also down 2%. And UK-based AstraZeneca fell nearly 5%. Pfizer, as you may recall, tried to buy that firm and invert for $120 billion, but was rebuffed. Eamon Javers in Washington has more on the nuts and bolts of the Treasury's proposed regulations, and Meg Terrell is on set with a closer look at the impact on the drug industry. Eamon, to start with you, what are these new rules the Treasury introduced? I know they're a little complicated. Yeah, they're using words like spin versions and hopscotching to describe the techniques that they're trying to stop here. But what Treasury is doing here is changing the IRS rules that govern how companies can engage in inversions and blocking some of the most common tactics that companies use. The idea here is to make inversions a lot more expensive for companies so they'll choose not to do it. What they couldn't do is block inversions altogether. That would take an act of Congress, a change of the law, and they don't have the votes up on Capitol Hill to do that. That in Capitol Hill doesn't seem like it's going to do anything now between now and the election that's coming up in November. So they said, you know what, we've got to move, we've got to move now. Treasury took the action yesterday, and this will be effective as of yesterday, Tyler. Mm -hmm. Meg, you've been on the phone all day uh, contacting a lot of these companies that do have deals in the works. So what do these new rules for me mean for them, and what were they telling you? <clears throat> well, it's not really clear right now. There's a big question mark over all of these companies' heads, and there's at least five big pharma companies in the middle of these inversion-type deals. So they've announced them, but they haven't yet closed them. They were expected to close in the fourth quarter or the early early in 2015. Some of those include Amvi and Shire, Medtronic and Covidian. and ones you mentioned. These are more than $40 billion deals. And what I'm hearing from analysts and bankers is everybody's reassessing right now. And while a lot of these companies say they would have pursued the deals anyway because they were things that they liked about the target companies other than just their positive tax rates, uh, is that they might want to renegotiate the terms of the deal, specifically Medtronic and Covidian. They might want to change the mix of debt and equity. And if they can't reach an agreement with Covidian if Medtronic can't, that might ruin the deal altogether, analysts say. So there's a lot of question marks going on here. Eamon, are these new rules the Treasury has proposed subject to challenge? Could anybody fight back against them? Yeah, there is some expectation here that there might be a lawsuit, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly from some of the companies who have deals in process that are now effectively blocked by this. Uh, but some folks I'm talking to in Washington say this appears to be very carefully written by Treasury to make sure that they stay within the four corners of their legal uh, uh, responsibilities here as Treasury and not getting too far into something that would be a, a law change. So the expectation, at least among folks I'm talking to here, is that this would survive a lawsuit. On the other hand, some of these companies feel like they've been wronged here and they might want to test it in the, mm -hmm. in the courts. 
And is that what you're hearing, Meg? I mean, will these companies go the full mile and uh, test it in the courts? That's some speculation among analysts like ISI Group's Terry Haynes. He was saying today that it might take one of these companies that's already in the middle of a deal to mm -hmm. sue Treasury, saying it doesn't have the purview to put these rules in place or it's not doing it the right way and to try to put a stop to these rules coming into place. But even today, we saw renewed speculation that Pfizer might try to do an inversion with activists. And, it, and Bloomberg News was reporting this story. They were saying Pfizer's not deterred by uh, these potential rules so we could still see more of these what we're seeing now is uncertainty and that causes some of these to take a pause and of course hits the stocks Meg Eamon thank you very much you bet thank you guys well, those inversion worries weren't the only reason for the market sell-off today. The escalating war in the Middle East and the economic impact of U.S. airstrikes in Syria, as well as downbeat data out of the Eurozone economy, also weighed on investor confidence. All 10 sectors of the S&P were in the red today. By the closing bell, the Dow lost 116 points, the Nasdaq was down 19, and the S&P off by 11 points. Reimagining impact, whatever that means, is the overall theme of this year's Clinton Global Initiative in New York City, where business, government, and entertainment leaders from around the world gather to discuss controversial issues and look for solutions. It's a big event filled with headliners, and it coincides usually with the annual UN General Assembly meeting across town. John Harwood was there. This is a rare event where the sitting president of the United States is not necessarily the principal focus, even on a day when he's discussing new airstrikes against Syria. That's because the Clinton Global Initiative draws celebrities from every field talking about ways to improve communities around the world, from actor Matt Damon discussing the need for clean water to Alibaba CEO Jack Ma talking about the rising impact of mobile technology. Young people so focused on the mobile phone, that is the opportunity. The world is going to be changed by the mobile phone, internet. Mobile technology, a country like you guys, helping young people succeed, helping young people to reach the information, helping young people to try the new things. Of course, given our host, it's no surprise the intersection of business and politics came up. Former President Bill Clinton said he supports the Obama Treasury's effort to curb corporate tax inversions. The Treasury should do what they can. It's their duty to collect whatever money is owed under American law. If they can find a way to discourage people from moving overseas, they ought to. But the best discouragement is to reform taxes and to give incentives to repatriate now nearly $2 trillion overseas. President Clinton acknowledged that he oversaw the last increase in the corporate tax rate, but he said it's now time to come together on a bipartisan basis to reduce it to keep America competitive with the rest of the world. John Harwood for Nightly Business Report, New York. Some encouraging news on home prices. They inched a little bit higher in July and have now regained much of what was lost in the 2008 housing crisis. They rose one-tenth of one percent in July. It doesn't sound like a whole lot, but they are still rising. And according to the Federal Housing Finance Agency, U.S. home prices are now only six percent below their all-time highs from 2007. The home prices aren't the only thing rebounding from the financial crisis. U.S. manufacturing activity for September currently hovering around a four-and-a-half-year high, that according to the financial data firm Market. The report also showed employment levels among producers rose to a two-and-a-half-year high. Manufacturing accounts for about 12 percent of the U.S. economy. China is also seeing a much-needed lift in manufacturing amid concerns that its overall economic growth may be slowing down. Yunus Yun has more from Beijing. HSBC's survey of China's manufacturing sector showed that factories here picked up steam in September. The flash PMI came in at 50.5, a modest improvement from August and better than what investors were expecting. New export orders were stronger as companies overseas ordered more goods from China. However, investors were concerned about the employment picture. The data showed factories shedding jobs at their fastest pace in five and a half years when China was grappling with a global financial crisis. Some economists say that the data means that manufacturers are bracing for tougher times as China slows down. Many expect the country's leadership to continue with targeted measures to keep growth going, while bad debt, excess capacity, and other hurdles continue to haunt the Chinese economy. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eunice Yu in Beijing. A disturbing new forecast concerning the rapid spread of the Ebola virus in Africa. The Atlanta-based Centers for Disease Control says that unless officials get the virus under control and quickly, Nearly a million and a half people could be infected in West Africa alone by January. 
But one official says it is still possible to avoid this worst-case scenario if a sufficient number of patients are isolated. Once this happens, the number of cases will likely decline very rapidly. Still ahead, will September, historically a bad month for stocks, deliver a pleasant surprise for investors in banks? The answer, coming up. Barclays Bank is paying a hefty fine for the way it mishandled customer funds. British banking regulators fined the U.K. bank a record $62 million for exposing its clients' money to what it called unnecessary risks and for keeping shoddy records. This is the second fine for the bank since 2011 over the way it handled customer accounts. Another big bank, Goldman Sachs, is looking to enter into the fast-growing business of exchange-traded funds. Goldman is seeking regulatory approval to design and sell to investors a variety of so-called ETFs, a series of actively managed ones, and others based on their own proprietary indexes created by the bank. Now, other banks have been moving in this direction. J.P. Morgan in June launched its first ETF, and Wells Fargo got the okay from regulators in August. Well, historically, September is the worst month of the year on average for the stock market, but this year it's shaping up to be a pretty good month for traders. And that could deliver a September surprise for the money center banks. Mary Thompson has the story. For traders, September is the make or break month in the third quarter. And this year, it looks like they might make it. What we're looking at is September being stronger than what we had seen. Across a wide range of trading businesses, Volume and volatility is up since the summer slump of August and a modest July. And that could be good news for big banks, including J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs, where trading revenue can be anywhere from 15 to 40 plus percent of a bank's total. The stock market's record run and a flood of initial public offerings, including the largest ever Alibaba's, among the reasons analyst Marty Mosby thinks September's looking better. So we've started to see some IPOs hit, uh, which caused some trading activity. As we're starting to see at least the middle part of the yield curve moving higher, and as we're seeing some foreign exchange volatility finally, uh, we could think that September uh, might be able to at least hold the third quarter in there close to what we saw uh, in the second quarter. Mix in the volatility seen in the oil markets and the higher levels of activity across commodities, currencies, bonds, and stocks, could create a September surprise. Still analysts, including Mosby, caution, it may not be enough to overcome the sluggish start to the quarter, meaning any surprise may be subtle. Yet after a year marked by declines in trading volume, a subtle change to the upside, a welcome sign for banks. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Mary Thompson. Shares of CarMax tumbled, even though the company posted earnings that topped estimates. And that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The used car superstore said its profit rose 10 percent in its second quarter, driven by an increase in used car sales. But its profit margins fell from a year ago, and sales rose less than expected. Shares plunged 9.5 percent to $47.80. Carnival hiked its outlook for the year as it reported that its third quarter profits jumped by more than 30 percent. The cruise operator's good results were driven by higher onboard spending and a stronger performance in its Asia division. Shares rose a fraction to $40.51. CF Industries was the best performing stock in the S&P 500 today. That's because the fertilizer company is in preliminary merger talks with Norway's Yara, which is also a fertilizer producer. Yara says there's no guarantee that any deal could come out of these discussions. Still, shares popped 5 percent to 269.37. Deer says it's mulling strategic options for its low-margin crop insurance business, and it has hired Citigroup as an advisor. Revenues at the farming equipment maker have been falling as farmers hold off from buying new products because of lower expectations for commodity prices and harvests. The stock lost a fraction to 83.32. 
The FTC may be looking to block the planned merger of Cisco and U.S. Foods, as according to reports. Regulators are considering an antitrust lawsuit because they're concerned that combining the nation's two biggest food suppliers could threaten competition. Shares of Cisco off 2% to 3675. Procter & Gamble's shedding the rest of its pet care businesses, selling its IMs and Yukonuba brands in Europe to Spectrum brands. The maker of household products like Tide detergent and other things says exiting the business will help it focus on its core units. The financial terms of this particular deal weren't disclosed. Shares of P&G down a little bit. 84.44 was the close there. And Facebook is unveiling a new ad platform. This is according to the Wall Street Journal to improve the effectiveness of online advertisements. The new tool will reportedly help marketers understand which Facebook users have seen or interacted with ads that appear on the social media. The move is Facebook's effort to challenge Google's dominance in the online ad space. Shares of Facebook up almost 2% on this otherwise down day to 78.29. And after the bell, shares of Bed Bath & Beyond initially popped on a strong earnings report. The retailer beat on both the top and bottom lines and gave an upbeat full year outlook. As you can see, shares rose after the close. They moved into the great beyond. Uh, during the regular trading day, Bed Bath & Beyond was down 1.5% to 62.69. As we reported earlier, former President Bill Clinton at the Clinton Global Initiative discussed issues important to business, including wages, the shrinking middle class, and what corporations care about most. Company after company uh, takes more of its profits and spends it on dividends, stock buybacks, management increases, and less on sharing it with the employees broadly. That, he said, will change over the next few years. But it could be one of the reasons why many Americans don't have a strong opinion of corporations. In a recent CNBC Burson Marsteller survey on corporate perception, 52 percent of people in developed nations have a favorable view of corporations, compared to 72 percent in developing countries. So what role do corporations have in society? Bill George, former CEO of Medtronic and now a professor of management at Harvard Business School, joins us to discuss this issue. Bill, thanks for coming on the program. Glad to have you here. Thanks, Susie. You know, another statistic out of that survey that sort of stood out for me, it says four in ten millennials and um, baby boomers view corporations as a source of fear not hope. So my question to you is, why the disconnect? And is it important to American corporations to fix this perception? Absolutely. It's essential. We've had 12 years of breaching the trust, going all the way back to Enron and then the financial crisis in 2008. And a lot of corporations are trying to rebuild it, but it takes a long time to rebuild that trust. And I think that's where we've got to go right now. President Clinton had it right. So you clearly think that corporate misbehavior is a contributor to the reason why Americans have a lower view of uh, corporate uh, uh, sort of imagery uh, than, than foreigners do. Has, does the wealth gap play in there as well, Bill? No doubt about it. Uh, the fact that Americans aren't earning as much and they're not sharing in the success of companies, I think that plays a big factor. And the fact that the government has been coming at business, instead of supporting our great global companies, the government's doing everything it can to uh, find them, to penalize them, uh, to send them to jail. And I think this has caused a breach of trust as well. It seems also there's a disconnect between what corporate America thinks their responsibilities are. I mean, we just heard from uh, President Clinton saying that, you know, they have to do more for the social good, so to speak. And that seems what the American public wants. Um, is there a way to bridge this misperception? Well, I think the CEOs today, we have the best group of CEOs we've ever had, and they're committed to rebuilding his trust. Every CEO I know, and I've spent a lot of time with a number of CEOs, is committed to this. But there's this clash between the Wall Street desires, a short term, let's make money now, the activist investors, people like Carl Icahn and Nelson Peltz taking on great companies like DuPont and PepsiCo. And this clash is hurting us. But business has got to recognize, I think, first and foremost, it has to, it's chartered to serve society. That's how we get our existence, whether we're in China or the U.S. or Japan. Of course, I guess those, those activist investors, Bill, would, would obviously say we have a salutary effect on, on corporations. We're making them better. That's for another, for another conversation, <laughs> obviously. But I, but I wonder why you think people not in the United States have a, 
have a more favorable view of large corporations than we do? Is it because they have don't know them as well? Why? Well, they haven't had the battering of large companies. They see them as the job providers, as I do, the wealth creators mm -hmm. uh, that are building these developing countries. And frankly, a lot of resources are going there as we don't have the growth opportunities in this country, Tyler. So what do you think is going to be the wake-up call for American companies? And uh, what's your prediction, let's say, 10 years from now? Is it the situation going to be the same, better, or maybe worse? Susie, we've had our wake-up call. The answer is for CEOs to come together with government, which we haven't been able to do, and declare that we're there to serve society everywhere we go in the world. And we're not just there to serve the short-term shareholder. And if we do that well, we serve our customers through our mainstream business. We create shared value, as my colleague Michael Porter has said. We will rebuild that trust. But we've got to put customers first. You can't put the shareholders first. Shareholders come third. We've got to put the customers first, the employees first, and if we do that, we'll build great long-term companies, and the shareholders will be huge beneficiaries, as they've been the last four or five years as the stock market. That's risen. a really interesting point, because I think an awful lot of, of, of people in the investment community would say that the ultimate uh, responsibility of a board, of a CEO, is to serve the shareholders, and, and they do come first. Well, I don't agree. The law says it's to the company and its shareholders. That's what the law says. And we've kind of forgot about the company. We want to sustain institutions. We want DuPont, Deere, you mentioned. These are great institutions. We want them to go on for another 100 years so they can compete globally and create jobs. And they're doing that. But I think people don't appreciate that. You can't just, as President Clinton said, you can't just use stock buybacks and uh, suck up your cash that way with more and more dividends. They're fine, but we've got to invest in the companies in research, in people, mm -hmm. and in market expansion. Bill, I'd love to sit in on your class at Harvard. Sounds fascinating <laughs> discussion. Bill George with Harvard Business School. Thank you. Well, that's what we teach, so thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Coming up, when times got tough, one small business decided to shift its strategy to survive and eventually thrive. We'll meet the business owners tonight. And we kick off our series, Small Business Matters. More health plan choices are coming to the federal insurance marketplace next year. Department of Health and Human Services officials, these are the folks who run the Affordable Care Act's healthcare.gov marketplace, now say that the number of providers offering health care plans in 2015 will increase by 25 percent. Meantime, government-backed hackers purposely breached the healthcare.gov website and got some mixed results. The Department of Health and Human Services sent its own hackers to break into the federal health insurance website, finding what it called a, quote, critical vulnerability during a security scam. But it didn't elaborate on exactly what the problem was. Probably wouldn't be so wise to elaborate. Now, those insider hackers also reported some strong defenses on the site, which aim, of course, to keep personal data secure. Several estimates show that the U.S. lost more than 170,000 small businesses during the Great Recession. And the ones that survived are leaner, more focused, and risk-averse, being careful not to repeat past mistakes. In the first segment of a series called Small Business Matters, Sharon Epperson talked to several entrepreneurs about lessons they've learned since then. Here's step one. When times are tough, cut the fat. Roberto and Colleen Crivello are the husband and wife team behind a company you may not have heard of. FDS is a design and brand building consultancy for the apparel industry. But you've likely seen their work. Our clients, they range from a boutique to Fortune 500 clients like DuPont or uh, The Gap or most recently Puma. FDS designs clothing for corporate clients and a year ago launched its own label, Chalk NYC a premium children's brand sold at luxury department stores, popular with celebrities and wealthy moms. One of its best-selling products, stretch leather pants for kids, 
with a $500 price tag sold at Barney's. I think what they've done really well is they understand exactly who they're selling to. They have a very sort of expensive product that uh, from, from a fashion line they're selling to parents that have the money to spend. We're excited. It's, it's been a good year so far. FDS has had many good years, but 2008 was the defining moment for this design company, a critical juncture when many other small businesses went out of business. Huge companies were laying people off. I mean, it, it was a big deal in fashion because it is fashion and it's, you know, it's one of the things that people cut from their budgets probably right away. With foresight and an effort to not go out of business, we decided to immediately restructure. What resulted was a leaner, more efficient FDS that operated virtually. By letting go full-time employees and hiring designers on a project basis, the company was able to cut down overhead costs and reduce unnecessary workspace. With our previous company, we had expenses of $200,000 a month. Now it's like 25000 So it's a drastic difference and it just makes a lot of sense. With the huge financial crash, they could have gone under and instead they were able to adopt. They were able to see what was happening in the world and make big changes in their business, which started by changing the whole sort of model of how they worked with designers. For FDS, the transition to working virtually, using mostly freelancers, has been seamless. We just love working this way, and it's been very, very efficient for us. It's a new way of working, I think. It's becoming the new model for many small businesses, and for some, the secret to their success. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Sharon Epperson. And finally tonight, the most expensive cities in the world to live and do business. And there's a new name at the top. Third place, the Big Apple, New York City. Second, the winner for the past five years, Hong Kong. And in the top spot now, London. A stronger British pound over the past year was the main driver for London's rise dubiously to the top. That's Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Susie Garrow. Thanks for being with us. And I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks for me as well. Have a great evening, everybody. We we'll hope to see you back here tomorrow night. I'm Susie Garrett with a nightly business report news brief. The Treasury's new rules aimed at curbing so-called corporate tax inversions slammed shares of some drug, biotech, and medical device companies that have multi-billion dollar merger deals in the works. That weighed on the markets, along with weak data out of Europe and concerns about the impact of U.S.-led airstrikes in Syria. At the close, the Dow fell 116 points, its second triple-digit loss in a row. The Nasdaq was down 19 and the S&P off 11 points. Some encouraging U.S. economic news. Manufacturing is now at a four-and-a-half-year high, and home prices are only 6 percent lower than their all-time highs. And General Motors is moving its Cadillac headquarters to New York City to get a hipper, more international image. Be sure to tune into Nightly Business Report right here on your public television station.